بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله نور السماوات والأرض مثل نوره كمشكاة فيها مصباح المصباح في زجاجة الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس والله بكل شيء عليم في بيوت أذن الله أن ترفع ويذكر فيها اسمه يسبه له ويذكر في حسمه يسبح له فيها بالغضب والآصال رجال لا تلهيهم تجارة ولا بيع عن ذكر الله وإقام الصلاة وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة يخافون يوما تتقلب فيه القلوب والأبصار ليجزيهم الله أحسن ما عملوا ويزيدهم من فضله والله يرزق من يشاء بغير حساب والذين كفروا أعمالهم كسراب بقيعة يحسبه الظمآن ماء حتى إذا جاءه لم يجده شيئا ووجد الله عنده ووجد الله عنده فوفاه حسابه والله سريع الحساب أو كظلمات في بحر اللجي يغشاه موج من فوقه يغشاه موج من فوقه موج من فوقه سحاب ظلمات بعضها فوق بعض إذا أخرج يده لم يكد يراها ومن لم يجعل الله له نورا فما له من نور ألم تر أن الله يسبح له من في السماوات والأرض يسبح له من في السماوات والأرض والطير صفات كل قد علم صلاته وتسبح 
فيها والله عليم بما يفعلون ولله ملك السماوات والأرض وإلى الله المصير ألم تر أن الله يزجي سحابا ثم يؤلف بينه ثم يؤلف بينه ثم يجعله ركاما فترى الودق يخرج من خلاله وينزل من السماء من جبال فيها من برد فيصيب به فيصيب به من يشاء ويصرفه عن من يشاء يكاد سنا برقه يذهب بالأبصار يقلب الله الليل والنهار إن في ذلك لعبرة لأولي الأبصار والله خلق كل تابة مما فمنهم من يمشي على بطنه Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Um, Jazakallah khair everyone for attending today. If there are any issues with my audio, then please uh, just pop it in the chat and then we can sort it out. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, my name is Dr. Badul Hussein Wali. I'm a medical doctor. I work in the NHS and alhamdulillah, I am associated with Cardiff branch uh, as part of UK Islamic Mission. So Alhamdulillah, we're all here today because we are covering this topic, which is called What is a Woman? And we are doing a thematic study of Surah Nur. So that means that we're really deep diving into all the topics that come up, discussing it and just trying to apply it to our everyday lives. Because our lives as women in the modern day world is very challenging. And we really need to look at these things and be honest with what's happening in society what is happening in our own homes and what is happening with ourselves so that we can move forward, inshallah. So we are covering all of these themes throughout the month, inshallah, and then we are bringing it all together via this slide, really. We are looking at the theme as our seed, and then inshallah, we are going to plant that into our lives. We are going to nurture that theme, and then we are going to bring about change. So it's not just about academia and learning facts sisters which I know that you all know is about actually making that application making that change so inshallah before we even begin today's topic I want everyone to be mentally ready that today is about change and every day of Ramadan is about change be it small or be it large so today's theme inshallah and the thing that we're really going to deep dive into is modesty so I think sometimes we hear the word modesty and we think, why are we talking about modesty again? Because modesty gets spoken about a lot nowadays and inshallah we'll discuss why. So I was thinking about it and actually um, I thought of roast potatoes and subhanAllah, I think this coming week, every, um, every presentation will have a reference to food, I'm afraid, but the reason why I thought of roast potatoes is it is something, it's only a few ingredients, only a few ingredients, but it comes together to make a dish and a dish that people make all the time. And sometimes, sisters, we overcomplicate things. When you look at global issues, and we learned a lot about them last week, Alhamdulillah, Sister Medeha did an excellent job, and we learned a lot about the things that are going on in society. And we think about all the damage and all the problems. 
And we sometimes think the solution isn't simple, but sometimes the solution is simple. You know, sometimes changing the world is as simple as just throwing in a different herb into a recipe and the recipe changes. When you even look at our own religion, sisters, think about it. The difference between hell and heaven is one kalima. Getting the basic parts of our Islam correct is what's is what will make all the difference and is what will change society, inshallah. So we are going to look at modesty and we're going to look at it from all angles, inshallah, and try to understand each other and understand each other's struggles. Because I know we will have sisters here today who may well be wearing naqab, may well be extremely modest, may well, uh, we will have sisters here today who might be struggling with the physical hijab, but they're very modest in their behaviors and their characters. And it's important we talk about all of these things so that we understand what everyone else is dealing with because that's what keeps the heart soft. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that the Ummah is like one body. You know, we have to feel for each other and understand the difficulties that we are each going through. And so this word modesty comes with a lot of baggage. And so before we really deep dive, I think we should start on a context that we can all agree with. So I've popped a scenario up on the screen. And basically the scenario is that you're playing with maybe your own child, your nephew, whoever it may be, and the child wins the game. And he starts showing off and he starts gloating and being rude. And you tell him, no, you shouldn't be that way. You should be modest. And they ask you, what, the, what is modesty? How would you explain modesty to a child, sisters? You can pop your answers in the chat box. I'm going to keep an eye there. So the idea is, I know all of you know what it means. I just want you to think in the in this specific context, in the context of winning a game and the child is being rude and showing off and you say, no, you have to be modest. And they ask you, what does modesty mean? What, what would you say to the child? How would you explain to them the concept of modesty, inshallah? And then once we look at it from this angle, then we can build on this. So if you just pop in the chat box, inshallah, I will keep talking once I know you sisters are typing away, inshallah. I think one of the things that is important about modesty and in this scenario is that you would teach the child to be polite. You, you shouldn't be rude. You shouldn't behave in that way, right? And that's part of being modesty. About, that is part of being modest. The thing is, sisters, modesty does not detract from anything. When you teach that child to be polite and to be nice, even if they've won the game, that doesn't mean that they've lost the game all of a sudden. They've still won, but it's about having good mannerisms. It beautifies the thing. And this is such an important concept because nowadays, when we think of modesty, we think it takes away from who we are. It takes away from our character our personality it takes away from our looks it takes away from this and that and from everything but subhanallah that's not true being modest does not take away in that sense the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when the companions were speaking to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they said o messenger of allah is modesty part of the religion and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no rather it is the entire religion the entire religion is modesty. But here is the interesting bit. If we read on, the Prophet Sallallahu said, verily, modesty, abstinence, retentance of the tongue, but not the heart, and deeds are all part of faith. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, they bring gain in the hereafter and loss in the world. This is the idea, sisters, that what is gained in the hereafter is much greater than what is missed in the world. Part of being modest and holding ourselves back in that way, the same way you would teach the child to be polite and to hold themselves back and not be rude and not to show off. Part of that is, yes, you may lose out on showing off in this world, but what you gain in the hereafter is much greater. So inshallah today, this we're all women here. This is a safe space and we're going to be talking about modesty as it pertains to women, 
and closing. And I just want everyone to remember, it doesn't distract from who you are. It doesn't make you any less. It doesn't make you any less beautiful. It doesn't make you any less of the person that you are. It's just not for everyone to see. So subhanAllah, let's move on. Okay, sisters, easy question for the chat. What is the first pillar of Islam? What is the first pillar of faith? What is the basic thing that makes us Muslim? If anyone, any of the sisters can just pop into the chats. What is the, what is the basic, what is the foundation? What do we have to say to become Muslim? The Shahada, excellent. Jazakallah khair sisters. The Shahada, the, the Kalima, Tawheed. This is an important point in that everything we have, every moment we have, every success we have is from Allah. That is what Tawheed teaches us, isn't it? That's what the Kalima teaches us. La ilaha illallah. Basically, there is nothing else. There is nothing else, else except from Allah. Allah is our creator. Allah is the most wise. How does that change us, sisters? When this is the foundation of our belief, how does that change us? It makes us modest. Because you realize that every single thing you have, every attainment, every moment of your life that you are proud of, it came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It humbles you like one of the sisters has put in the chat. Exactly that, it humbles you. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Very, verily every religion has a character and the character of Islam is modesty. That is why, because when you understand where Allah is and where you are, it changes you. It changes you entirely. And when it comes to being Muslim women in the UK, modesty is our Islam. Because there is nothing more humbling than knowing that you, sisters, you belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know that nowadays there's this huge narrative of being like a strong, independent woman. But there is no shame in saying that we are dependent on Allah. And we follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rules. And that is the spiritual aspect of modesty. SubhanAllah, when we look at the society we live in, in this Western society, there's this idea that people ask, why does your religion tell you to do this and tell you to do that and tell you to do this? And it all comes back down to Tawheed, this fundamental belief that we belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, as the week progresses, and as we learn about Surah Nur and the Nur of Allah and this guidance, what you will find is that when this guidance shines on your hearts, there are going to be places of our hearts that we are not entirely happy with. You know, places that we know need a little bit of work. And especially today's topic, sisters, when it comes to modesty, it's one of those things that many people think, you know, I am just not ready yet to tackle this. And what I will say is that's fine, stay with us. But what you need to know is where you are heading. Because many, many people say this phrase that I'm on a journey. If you've heard of that, subhanAllah, think about it. Have you heard people say this? I feel like I may have said it myself at some point. When we speak about our lives as Muslims, we say that we are on a journey, that we're making progress, we're on a journey. But in order to make progress, you need to know where you're going, right? We can't just sit at the stain, uh, train station, just sit there and say, well, I'm on a journey. It doesn't work like that. You need to know where you are and where you want to go. So inshallah, today's conversation is understanding that. We are having this conversation to empower you, sisters. You should know your religion. You should know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for you. And it's down to you to achieve that. So that when our politicians, subhanAllah, they say things like our sisters, our Muslim sisters look like letterboxes, or when elsewhere in the world people are burning the hijab, you should know where you stand and where we stand as Muslims. And subhanAllah, we stand wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed us. So moving on, I've got three apparently random photos on the screen, but they are linked. And I'll give you, I'll explain how they're linked, inshallah, after asking a few easy questions. This is what color do people typically wear to funerals? It's very, um, it's just part of the customs here. The, yes, black. People t tend to wear black at funerals. Okay. And let me ask you another question. 
if you're walking, say you're walking um, through a building and there's someone right behind you and you've walked through a set of doors, what would you normally do? So you're walking through the doors and there's someone directly behind you. Would you slam the door in their face? Hold the door, yeah? Easy, they're not trick questions. You'd hold the door for them. Yeah, exactly. Alhamdulillah, well managed, <laughs> okay. The third picture we have is of toothpaste. When we have young children, you'll know that you have to teach them to brush their teeth, right? And sometimes they won't want to brush it and they won't understand why. And they may never understand why, they may understand why when they're much older, but we still teach them to do that. These are all rules, sisters, that we follow in our day-to-day -day lives. We follow these rules in our day-to-day -day lives without even thinking about it. You know, we know, you know, if it's a funeral, you're not gonna turn up wearing bright yellow. If someone's walking behind you, you're gonna open the door for them. These are small things that we follow day-to-day. -day. And the reason why I mention this is because a lot of the time when we discuss religion, um, alhamdulillah, not amongst us, but in the greater world, in the UK as well, there's a secularization. There's this idea that your religion should be in your personal life. It is your hobby. It's what you do when you come home from work. That's fine. It shouldn't interfere with anything else. And if it does, that means your religion is too restrictive. It's too strict. It's too harsh. But at the end of the day, sisters, we are following rules all of the time, all of the time. You know, we know that on weddings, which colors we should and shouldn't wear. We know, um, you know, if we're going to somewhere fancy, we shouldn't wear jeans. If we're, you know, if we're going somewhere where someone might be upset, we shouldn't turn up in full glam makeup. You know, we have all of these rules that we follow all the time. But Alhamdulillah, today, we're not going to talk about what people want you to do and what people are telling you to do. We're going to focus on what our religion tells us. So these are the three big questions. Why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about modesty? Because, alhamdulillah, we're all women here and modesty has a societal impact. And that's why we need to talk about it. And why am I talking about it to you? Because even if sisters, you don't feel you're there yet to make some sort of big jump in terms of modesty, you need to know where you're going. And do we have to talk about this? Yes. I'm going to just put this out there. I'm just setting the scene for everyone, sisters, because we need to be in a mental place where we're ready to make change. And I know sometimes we have bad experiences. You know, maybe someone was rude about the way that you were dressed. Maybe someone was rude about this. Lots of things happen to us day to day. But inshallah, in these sessions, I want everyone to come in with a fresh mind. Because we are learning through Allah's nur how to address these things. And we have to address them. Because we can't just spend our lives, you know, subhanAllah, we can't just spend our lives being really good at doing charity work or really good at praying to Hajjid, or really good at doing all these extra things that are very good deeds in of themselves, and then just ignore one of the big commandments from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's fard, that's mandatory upon us. So I know a lot of the times, and I think this is part of the way shaitan works as well, he distracts us, he keeps us busy in other things. And actually, the main thing that we need to do, we forget about. So inshallah, to understand this theme of modesty, we'll look at our soil at the moment. Where are we today in terms of the beauty standard? Does anyone want to pop in the chat what they think the beauty standard is today? Nowadays, uh, whether it be in our Asian culture, uh, whatever background you may be from, what is the expectation? I think when it comes to beauty standards, the expectation is to be beautiful in all situations, in all phases of life, like one sister Sarah has said, to show what you have. That's the expectation. If you're beautiful, um, what is the saying? If you have it, flaunt it or something like that. That is the idea. That's the current beauty standard. Have a look at the screen, sisters. This I found really interesting. This is taken straight from a website to do with um, glow ups, basically. It's for people who want to take themselves 
who are looking, who look a certain way, who want themselves, who want to look better. And this is what they've got on there. Attractive people receive better job prospects. Individuals are more satisfied with attractive partners. Attractive people enjoy a higher quality of life, sisters. This is our society right now. Success is based so closely to appearance. It's not to do with your skills, your intellect. This is supposed to be the society that liberated women. Can someone ask, what would happen if you are not con conventionally attractive? Do, this is why if you look at celebrity culture, they are literally pursuing beauty until they die because you have to have it. That's the way our society functions. What have you got in the chat? Too much makeup, not necessarily makeup. There's different, less opportunities, exactly. Appearance is, has become so important in terms of moving forward in your life. I pop this on the screen. I want to ask a question, sisters. Does anyone know what BBL is, what it stands for or what it is? If you know, pop it in the chat. The beauty standard is a set standard to be followed, like one of the sisters has mentioned, but also it changes constantly. What's in fashion constantly changes. And one of the things I've got on the screen is BBL. This is a type of surgery in which they take fat from one part of your body and they move it towards your buttocks, basically, to make it look like you have a bigger bum. That's what it is. Do you know what this death rate is for this surgery? One in 3,000 people die after this surgery, but people are still willing to do it. People go abroad to do it. People are willing to die to be beautiful. This is what you know. the West is calling loving yourself. This is the beauty standard. How can we call this love, sisters? If you had, I know many of the sisters here have children as well. Could you ever imagine looking at your child, looking at the child that you love and thinking, I wish I could, you know, take that child for plastic surgery and get them a nose job. You would never think that because you love them for who they are. That's what true love is. When you talk about loving yourself, you shouldn't be willing to undergo, you know, go under the knife. And I know these things seem extreme, but when you look at some of the things that we're doing nowadays on a daily basis, they would seem extreme to the generation before. Just a normal makeup routine, your primer, your foundation, your highlight, your contour, your bronzer, your lip liner, your lipstick, your lip plumper, eyeliner, mascara, eyeshadow, setting spray, perfume. It goes on and on and on. And there's nothing wrong with being, with pursuing beauty to a certain extent, but we have to look at our choices because, alhamdulillah, we're looking at Surah Noor. And so we're looking at guidance. And the only way that we can be guided is if we are honest about where we are at. We need to be honest, sisters, because we spoke a lot about Western society this and Western society that. We need to speak about ourselves as well and what we are doing. You know, how many people wear, make how many people wear makeup at home, a full face of makeup, and then wash it off without anyone ever seeing it? You know, I know there may be some sisters, but the vast majority of people do not do this. Makeup inherently is worn to be seen by other people. That is just the way that it is. OK, so we've got makeup and we've got surgery and I'm not conflating the two. I know one is much more extreme than the other, but the root problem is the same. The root problem is looking at yourself and thinking there's something wrong with the way that you look and wanting to fix it. And the psychology of that every morning analyzing your face and trying to adjust the way it looks to make it look a little bit better. This is strange. This is really, really strange. And we've normalized it as a society. I've put on the screen a picture. Can anyone tell me what the sort of brown lines are and what the pinkish lines are, inshallah? And then I'll have a look at the chat as well. So if you know what the brown lines are, Pop it in the chat. What do you think it is? What are, what are these pictures showing? Contouring. Exactly. Contour and highlights. Alhamdulillah. So the idea for sisters who are not aware is contouring changes the shape of the face. It affects where the light hits the face and what the face looks like. 
Does anyone know the history of this, where it came from? Where was it first used? I, I'll tell you where it first came from. It first started on stage actors. The actors on the stage would use this to make their facial uh, expressions more vivid. And when I say actors, that would be men playing females. Okay. And in fact, it was so common for men playing females to use makeup and for prostitutes to use makeup that Queen Victoria famously said that makeup is vulgar because it's only used by actors and prostitutes. That's where this makeup comes from. These makeup ideals that we use, that's where it came from. This is come from the drag community. It's come from gay men that dressed as women or even straight men that dressed as women. This is the history of the things that we are doing. And I think a lot of us don't know where these things come from and they slowly, slowly come into our lives and we should be aware because that's what empowers us to make good decisions, inshallah. When there is so much emphasis on attractiveness, then where does that leave modesty? Because modesty itself is a desirable quality. Most people want to be known as being modest. When, when it comes down to it, there, there are rules and there are no rules at the same time. If you're buying a wedding dress, then you don't want to show too much of your chest because that would be immodest. But it's okay if the back is low. And if you're going to the beach, then it's okay to wear a bikini uh, rather than a swimsuit. But, um, you know, you, you don't want to be completely nude at the beach. But then if you're going for a wax, then it's fine to... Do you see the rules change, sisters? The rules keep changing. And we spoke about this. Uh, Sister Medija did an excellent job speaking about this when we were discussing civilization. And inshallah, we're going to touch it again later on this week. I think a lot of the times, and one of the things people may ask you is like, why does religion have to police my body? Why do you, you know, why, why does religion even care about this? But the thing that we forget is that we are already chained. The people and these um, etiquettes and these laws and these rules, they already exist. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sets us free. And we have to ask ourselves, why are we jumping through so many man-made hoops? Who are we jumping for? And how far are we going to go? Because once you outstep that limit of, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set, then where are, you going, where are you going to go? If you're already doing something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with, then how do you draw the line? How do you draw the line? When, where, how much nudity is too much nudity? How much is this, you know, dress with a slit or a see-through dress? This is how things progress. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu said near the end of time, there will be people fornicating on the roads. Things progress. There is a slippery slope that happens. And what does this do to the society? It sucks the life out of it, sisters. It sucks the life out of it. It ruins relationships. This is how many of the births in the UK do you think happened out of wedlock? What percentage? Give me a number. How many births happen out of wedlock? 10%, 20%? So out of wedlock means so out of marriage. 40%, 80 70 good sisters. So it's 51% of children are born out of marriage. And we really, you know, we big up being a single mum in this society, but we also acknowledge that the ideal is to have two parents. Why, why is this happening? The divorce rate is increasing, is 42% is the divorce rate. And do you know, sisters, does anyone know what the main reason cited is for the divorce? Did you have to give a reason? Any ideas? Why do you think people are divorcing? The main reason cited, adultery, extra, essentially, yes, unreasonable behavior, shameless behavior. There is so much shameless behavior. SubhanAllah, this is, I don't want to get too much into it because we need to touch on the verses as well, but there are literally mothers and daughters both working in the adult industry, the sex industry. When you break one rule, 
you end up breaking many, many more. You know, even if you speak to your elders, they will tell you there was a generation where you could tell who was married and unmarried uh, amongst the women just by looking at them, by looking at the amount of modesty and how they were sitting. And this is the change that's happened in one generation. Okay. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want from us? Because we realize that society affects us and we affect society. We have a role to play. And the nur that Islam gives us, it gives us that guidance so that we can make a change. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want from you? Because the people are going to pull us in a hundred directions. Every season, the fashion will change. And there's this idea that anything, it's a very secular mindset, that anything you do that goes against your desires is a burden. But that's not how Islam works. The baseline in Islam is that women are beautiful. All women. Islam does not make it haram to be beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us a lesson in Surah Nur, though, that your beauty is not for everyone. It is not your defining quality, sisters. It is not your pursuit in life, and it is not what society should be based on. So if we get the verses up on the screen, and tell the believing women that they should lower their glances, guard their private parts. So the, this um, aspect of the verse, Alhamdulillah, lower their gaze, we'll discuss tomorrow, and guard their private parts we discussed last Thursday. So inshallah, we're just covering the next bit of the verse. And not display their charms be beyond what is acceptable to reveal. They should let their headscarves fall to cover their necklines and not reveal their charms. Okay. So inshallah, what we are going to be talking about is what we cover when we are outside of the home or where non-mahrams can see us. Essentially, what Surah Nur does is it sets out guidance by limiting who can see us in all our beauty sisters. That is a small step we can take, and it is enough to overthrow the beauty standard. And do you know how I know that is enough to overthrow the beauty standard? Because look at how the media talks about hijab. It's just a covering, if you think about it. But look how it's vilified. Look how it plays out on the media. And so that is why this very small, it's not even a full verse. It's just a part of the verse. If we apply this to our lives, we can change the entirety of society. So inshallah, we'll have a look at what this verse tells us and then how we can apply it to our everyday lives. So basically in pre-Islamic Arabia, the women, they used to have a sheet over their head. They used to wear like a scarf. Imagine a cloth, but just over their head and it would hang on either side. So you could see their neck, you could see their ears, you could see their chest. It was literally just a cloth over their head. And this verse came to teach the Muslim women to be different sisters, to build your, your own identity. And there are two words here that I want to go into a bit more depth in. You, you see the word khumr, bi khumri hinna, khumr. This is the plural of the word khimar. And so that means a cloth that covers your head, your neck, and your chest. The reason why I'm pointing this out is because a lot of the times, in the West particularly, and sometimes sadly amongst Muslims too, there is this idea that, well, it doesn't even say anything about hijab like that in the Quran and you're all just being extreme. No, no, it's definitely there. It says a cloth that covers the head, the neck, and the chest. And then the next, juyub hinna. Juyub again is the plural of the word jayb. And this means you're kind of like the upper bit of your shirt just before, uh, just below your neck. So in all in all, what it's saying is to wear a covering that covers your hair, your head, your neck, and your whole chest. Okay, and to not reveal your charms. Okay, sisters, we're all uh, women here, so I'm going to be very, very frank and open with you because a lot of the time we don't like it when men talk about our clothes. So we're all women, so I'll, I will talk about our clothes, inshallah, today. Not reveal their charms. What does this mean? This means that it should be a loose outer garment. So you're wearing your normal clothes, you wear something loose on top of it, and you wear a scarf that covers your chest and not to show your charm. That means 
don't wear something that in of itself is an adornment. What do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. If you are completely covered the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked you to be covered, and then you put like a whole massive gold necklace on your head, right? Then that you you're revealing your charms. That makes sense, right? Okay. Now let's think of the example of sort of like a maxi dress, because that's very common nowadays. There are maxi dresses that are made of viscose, and I'm pointing this out because a lot of the time I think we don't realize things, things don't click, and we don't tell each other things either, so we don't realize. But subhanAllah, even though it's a full covering, it's such that it clings to the body. So you can literally see like the outline of people's undergarments when they're wearing such things. And so it's important that not only does it cover you, but it doesn't reveal anything. So it needs to be somewhat thick and, and loose. And you shouldn't take a necklace and kind of hang it on your head or around your chest or whatever. You're covering it. The purpose of it is to cover. Okay. So inshallah, if you have any questions, sisters, pop them in the chat. We're just going to go through the verses and then we're going to learn how to apply them to our everyday life, inshallah. There are some exceptions to who you have to cover in front of, okay? So essentially, it's your father, your father-in-law, your son, your husband's sons, um, as in from other wives, your brothers, including your stepbrothers, the sons of your brothers, so your nephews, and the sons of your sisters, again, your nephews. And these are all your mahrams. So I took that list from this verse and the verse in Surah Al-Ahzab, which talks about this commandment. Okay, so this is only with regards to hijab, this outer covering. Now, let's look at the verse in a bit more detail, because I think all of us sort of understand that in terms of who we can and can't cover in front of in terms of men. Let's have a look at the next bit of the verse, because this is very important, sisters in the society that we're living in they're women folk so we can there's a difference of opinion here so the scholars they say you can uncover in front of muslim women but there's a difference of opinion regarding non-muslim women some say it's better that you do but it's not um it's better that you wear hijab in front of them but you don't have to however sisters i want to point out something that we touched upon last week that there is a rise in transgenderism. There are more and more people on hormone blockers. There are more and more people dressed in an androgynous sort of way where you can't really tell. So we just really need to be mindful of who are removing our hijab in front of, especially because there are more and more women who, um, you know, we have more and more members of like LGBTQT nowadays as well. So it's not as simple as I'll wear it in front of men and I will take it off in front of women. Just be very mindful because even the Prophet Sallallahu advised us that no woman should describe another woman to her husband so that it is as though they are looking at her. That is a lesson to us. So this, this one word teaches us two things. One, be mindful of who you're taking your hijab off in front of because it's a very hypersexualized society. And the second thing that we need to be mindful of is that when we are speaking to sort of our husbands or our brothers, whoever it may be, not to start describing sisters that we've seen without their hijabs in such detail that they can imagine what they look like. Okay. And then we move on and it says they're slaves, such men as attend them who have no sexual desire. So I just wanted to highlight this one point as well, sisters. Where it says men who attend them who have no sexual desire, this is about people who are very confused, very sort of deranged, who have no understanding whatsoever of um, the way that women look or things like this, if that makes sense. And it's the same uh, with regard to this word tifl here, with regards to children who are not yet aware of women's nakedness. Basically, very young children, very young boys who really don't. It, it doesn't make a difference to them if it's a man or a woman. They don't know about the way that women look. They don't feel attracted to women in that way. Okay, I've spoken a lot. So now it's your time to speak, sisters. Here is the scenario. I'm hoping everything I've said so far has made sense. So we covered how, we, how our hijab should be 
in terms of it should cover our head, our hair, our neck, our chest, and we should wear an outer garment over it. We've covered who we're allowed to take hijab off in front of, um, and that includes our mahrams and Muslim women. And now, inshallah, I'm going to put in front of you this scenario. You have asked your child to get up at nine o'clock in the morning tomorrow. And the next day comes and you hear the alarm go off. So you hear the alarm has gone off. You hear your kid get up and they go and they switch off the alarm and they go back to bed. How would you feel about this? Would you feel like they had listened to you? What would you do if this was your child, sisters? And I'm going to relate it back to the topic. I know it seems a bit random at the moment. But if this was your child and you had asked them to get up in the morning and they get up, they turn off the alarm and go back to bed, you'd feel ignored and you would feel hurt. Very good. Thank you, Sister Noor. You'd feel disappointed because you'd asked them to do something and they kind of half did it. They got up and then they switched it off and they went back to bed. Why have I put this here? It's about the spirit of the ruling sisters. You asked your child to get up. And yes, technically they did get up, but all they did was switch off the alarm and go back to bed. They didn't actually fulfill what you were trying to get them to do. Does that make sense, sisters? When it comes to the ruling of hijab, when it comes to the ruling of hijab, we have to fulfill the spirit of the ruling. Do you know that the Jews, they also have a commandment that commands their women to cover their hair. And do you know how their women cover their hair? They wear a wig, subhanAllah. A lot of the time we are covering ourselves, but we are not fulfilling the spirit of the ruling. We are not actually fulfilling what the ruling wanted us to do. And the main way that we fall into this is actually makeup sisters. I, I know a lot of sisters are trying their best and it's the case of you you wear everything, you've covered everything. You know, subhanAllah, some sisters are even wearing full naqab, but then they're wearing full eye makeup. Or maybe they're not covering their face, but they have a full face of makeup. Where is the spirit? In the same way that you'd be disappointed if you asked your child to do something and he only sort of half did it or found a technicality, we shouldn't be looking for technicalities in our religion. And the last bit of the verse, is they shouldn't stamp their feet as to draw attention to any hidden charms. So this is regard to the people um, in pre-Islamic Arabia. What they would do with, was they had anklets on their feet and they would stamp their feet so that you could hear it. And so again, this is teaching us about modesty in a holistic way. Overall, don't, don't go out of your way to show what is hidden. You know, so that goes with regards to any adornment, so bracelets and anklets and all of this. But in the same regard, you know, if you're walking down the street, you shouldn't be like singing and laughing manically and just making a lot of noise and drawing loads of attention to yourself. This is part of the spirit of the ruling. This is part of being modest. This is part of our Islam. Our modesty is not just about covering the skin the way that it is in the West. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said some women are clothed but naked, inclining to evil and seducing with it. They will not enter paradise, nor will they smell its fragrance, even though it can be found from a distance of 500 years of travel. Some women are clothed but naked. Modesty is not just about covering the skin. These women are clothed but naked because of the nature of their clothes. Um, in fact, you can, if you've ever seen pictures of Met Gala, you will see that there are celebrities wearing thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds worth of clothes. And it's like they're not wearing any clothes because of how transparent and see-through and slits. And it's subhanAllah, we're living in strange times. So nowadays, there's a lot of terminology. So we've got niqab, abaya, jilbab, khimar, hijab, lots of different things. I think... One of the things I wanted to point out with regards to niqab, because a lot of times this comes up that, you know, especially from non-Muslims trying to criticize the religion, they'll say, well, there's nothing in your book that says about covering the face. When we were talking about the verse that was revealed about 
um, drawing your veils over yourselves. When that was revealed, actually the, the Ansar, the women at the time of Medina, they covered their face. That's how they understood it to be. And so I just wanted to point that out so that you're all aware that there is that opinion, there is that understanding of the verse and that it is in the Quran because again, some of our politicians and some of the people in leadership say strange things. So we should know our religion. The reason I put terminology up on the screen is because there's a definition of modesty that we that the non-Muslims have that we've spoken about. And we've spoken about our definition of modesty. Let's deep dive into it a little bit more. Language is very powerful, sisters. And so nowadays, we aren't, we are not fulfilling what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to do, but we say we're dressing modestly. And so this is problematic. This is really pro problematic. You know, when, when I understand what people, what we're trying to say is that, you know, we're not completely naked, but we can't say that we are dressing modestly. Modest dress is that which is defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what we just discussed previously. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's definition is above all other definitions. The purpose of hijab, sisters, the wisdom. The wisdom of hijab is your identity. So that look at the verse on the screen that is more suitable that they will be known. The purpose of hijab is so that you also will be known as Muslim. And this is very important. This is about building our identity. We are people who believe in Allah. We believe in consequences. We believe in accountability. We believe in the hereafter. We are, you are not like other people, sisters. You are not like them. You are different because you, you know there is accountability for your actions and we need to support each other. We, we are not followers. We are trendsetters at the end of the day. And one of the best things you can do to support your Muslim sisters wearing hijab is to wear hijab too. Because when you are visible as, as a Muslim woman wearing full hijab the way it should be worn, then you give confidence to other people. Because subhanAllah, we have more and more Muslim women doing amazing things in the world, really amazing. And we have more and more Muslim women in pub public platforms, and that's what we want. But how useful is that when they do not look Muslim, when you can't identify that they're Muslim? It doesn't achieve as much. When we, subhanAllah, this outside the scope of today's session, but when we study the Quran, we see this again and again and again, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down such guidelines to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa instructed the people such that the Muslims would have their own identity. This is when you wear hijab and you wear it properly, you will look different and that is okay. I think inshallah, we will, we, we will do this scenario actually. Okay, so you are checking your phone settings all the time and you're realizing you're spending way too much time on apps. You're realizing you're spending hours on Instagram and TikTok every day. And so you tell yourself, I'm just going to upload this photo of some food I ate yesterday when I went out for a meal, and then I'm just going to get on with my day. But then you just keep coming back and you keep checking your notifications. Sisters, what is the impact of this behavior on yourself and on others, the way that we use social media? What, what is the negative impact here? What's happening? The negative impact, would you agree, is yes, it's, it's time wasting. You're not being attentive to the other people around you. You're constantly going back to this, constantly thinking, constantly scrolling. It distracts you from the true purpose of life. Very good. Let me ask you a question. Do you think you're helping other people's self-esteem when you take such photos of your lifestyle, the best, very, very best selected, filtered bits of your life and you put it online? Are you helping your Muslim sisters? No, it's not helping. We need to be part of the solution. Part of being modest online, as well as the clothing, is the behaviors and the things that we are showing other people that we are doing. Okay, inshallah. Narrative builds about showing off. Make it, exactly, it distracts you from your true, uh, true purpose. 
it creates a fake lifestyle and people idolize that fake lifestyle. We watch someone else doing it, then we start doing it. And then they see us and then they start doing it and it creates a huge problem. And we want to be part of the solution, sisters. Okay, this is the last bit of the verse. Believers, all of you turn to God so that you may prosper. So that you may prosper. Sisters, we all have different natures. We all have different personalities. We all have different parts of the religion that we find easy and different parts that we find difficult. You know, some will be like the Ansar and will be able to just put it on. Others have barriers to hijab. There's a lot of things that stop us. You know, some of us have been waiting at that station trying to figure out where our destination is, you know, like we spoke about at the beginning. Some of us have been intending to wear it for many years. Some of us are wearing it with makeup. Some of us are showing our necks. Some, whatever it is that is our weakness, inshallah, we're going to run through some of the barriers so that we can work on it. So that we can work on it. Because at the end of the day, it is for sisters. You know, the same way that if you have small children, you'll know that sometimes they want to go outside wearing like really funny, weird clothes. They want to be wearing like, um, like, uh, t-shirts in the middle of winter and things and you have to teach them and then you make them wear that coat it's the same concept this is far we have to do it but let's work through some of the barriers so social media like some of the things that you've mentioned about about making this false narrative but also when we look at certain images if you are looking at something every single day and comparing yourself to it sisters you're not doing yourself any favors it's not going to make it easier for you to cover when you're looking at people who are uncovered all of the time and we'll be speaking about this a bit more tomorrow family sisters if you are the only one who covers or inshallah will be covering in your family it can be very difficult very very difficult um you know sometimes you can feel like a bit of a hypocrite we'll speak about hypocrisy in another session inshallah but this is some of the issues sisters if you have any ideas or thoughts on what some of the barriers are that make it difficult for people to wear hijab, pop it in the chat. I'll just run through what we got on the screen, but I'm sure that you all have lots of ideas as well. So what are the barriers? What are the things that stop people from taking that step and taking that leap and wearing hijab the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to? I've got on the screen, friends, sometimes, um, Friends can make each other better. You know, I'm, there was a group of sisters that I know from university. They all started wearing scarf all together. All of them wore it together. And sometimes, depending on the company you keep, friends can make you worse. You might, stay, you might start off wearing hijab and then you actually leave it. You know, you might start off wearing full abaya and now you're wearing maxi dresses with makeup. You, uh, one of the sisters put society. In what way? How does... Um, uh, Sister Sarah, feel free to expand. How does uh, society become a barrier to wearing hijab? Expectations, sisters. What will people think? This is a big thing. I think this stops a lot of people from making that final step. They think, what is someone going to think of me if I start wearing hijab? If you are firm on what you stand and on your values, no one will ask you to change. No one will ever ask you to change. No one goes to a mountain and asks the mountain to move because they know the mountain is not going to move. What have we got in the chat? People looking down on you and then extending this to how they treat you and your children. Yes, people make a lot of negative assumptions about sisters who wear hijab. Sometimes they think, you know, they're uneducated, they're this, they're that. But things are changing because, alhamdulillah, we have more and more Muslim women in uh, doing great things in society and if all of the Muslim women today who are doing great work for society if all of them covered the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to cover then the whole perception of hijab would change so if people are looking down on, on us then we should definitely wear it to show them that we are not the way that they think that we are having to be an example yes the pressure, the pressure of having to be basically a perfect Muslim when you're wearing hijab, but that's okay. It's it's okay. It's a lot of pressure, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for us. And you're right. I think a lot of sisters struggle with this. They feel like they have to be perfect if they're going to wear hijab. And this is shaitan basically whispering and saying that you're a hypocrite for wearing it. 
and we will cover hypocrisy in a lot more detail in about not next week the week after inshallah could no longer just put your shoes on and leave the house yes yeah it depends it's a mindset thing isn't it you know on the one hand it's oh i can't just leave the house just like this on the other hand it's easier because it doesn't matter what you're wearing you can wear your abaya on top and you can leave the house so it depends which way you look at it and it is a mindset thing in terms of low self-esteem i think a lot of people think that you feel like you won't be beautiful if you're wearing hijab but it goes back to that thing we spoke about at the beginning modesty does not detract from anything you don't lose your beauty by wearing hijab it just it's still there you still have it it's just not for everyone to see okay sisters lack of long-term vision let's go back to the verse believers all of you trust to god so that you may prosper sisters what is success what is success as a muslim what do we define this success as what is the greatest success what are we trying to achieve why are we in the dunya where are we trying to get to jannah excellent it's not a trick question we're trying to get to the hereafter and so when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse believe is all of you trust to god so that you may prosper that means so that you may attain success that you may attain jannah so it's part of our religion to think about the hereafter and so i wanted to speak to all of you today about something and it's not to upset anyone but it's just it's part of our religion it's part of our mindset to make sure that we are prepared for the hereafter and alhamdulillah we are all alive right now we are able to make change so it's important we have these discussions this is have any of you ever um when someone passes away there are certain things that we do to the body of the person that has passed away to prepare them before we bury them has anyone ever um sort of prepared um someone who's passed away for the burial and if you have could you just pop in the chat roughly what what takes place what are the basic steps i think my questions are too challenging today <laughs> russell yes you do the russell of the person who passed away before you bury them and you cover them with the white cloth very good you dress and you cover the head okay excellent sisters i'm going to ask you something very simple sisters if you pass away and you are wearing uh false eyelashes or individual eyelashes who is going to remove them if you've got acrylic nails who is going to remove them if you've got lip filler in your lip who is going to dissolve that lip filler this when we pass away and that period of ghusl before the burial yes that is the transition period is it not that is as soon as you die the next thing that happens is this ghusl and this preparation for being buried for being buried that is the transition period sisters and you want to get that right imagine passing away you don't want to pass away and be in such a position where even your ghusl and your burial wasn't quite right where does where have you started off it's really a, you're starting off on the wrong foot entirely for your journey into the hereafter and i'm not doing it i'm not saying this just to scare monger it is reality we do not know when we are going to die and in which situation we will be in when we die and we really you don't want to be in a situation where you know there's no one there who can dissolve your lip filler or if you've got implants get rid of your implant or if you've got individual lashes stuck to your eyelashes or if you've got acrylic nails no one can remove them you know subhanallah what are you, what are we setting ourselves up for think of the long term vision the long term vision is jannah you need to be jannah focused everything you're doing needs to be for you to get to there and this is a mindset it's a mindset and i know it seems hard to do these things but subhanallah There are many sisters who don't wear hijab but they pray. So you're able to put it on for prayer. Many sisters who never wear hijab but then when they go on umrah obviously they wear hijab. You can do it then. It's a mindset thing. And in fact sometimes we put on hijab in situations where we don't need to put on hijab. You know, um if so, if there is someone is um 
uh, if someone is giving the azan, people put start putting on a hijab. If someone uh, at weddings, there are strange customs where people are walking over your um, walking with the Quran over your head and you've got a hijab on then, you know, we put on hijab in situations that don't need hijab. We make so many rules for our, ourselves and we ignore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rule. And so it's about taking that leap to be modest. This is don't let this just be another talk where you heard about modesty. Don't let it be that. Start in Ramadan. Ramadan is the easiest, easiest time to make changes in your life because people are supportive. Everyone knows that everyone changes in Ramadan. You know, ultimately the society talks about my body, my choice. It is your choice, sisters, but it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave you this body and this body will give testimony on the day of judgment. Okay, inshallah. Oh, we're going backwards. There we go. La ilaha illallah. Wear it for Allah. Wear it for Allah. This is one of the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I keep saying that because we approach it from this angle of I'm not ready yet. It's too much. It's this. It's that. And I know it's difficult. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that it is not difficult, but it is far. And we should never forget that it is far. And it is a manifestation of your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there is this mindset that I am modest from the inside. One of the sisters mentioned it as well in the chat that sometimes people do think like this. But what is on the inside goes on the outside. Belief leads to actions. They cannot be separated. Internal modesty shows on the outside. And for many people think, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. He may forgive us about the smallest of things. And yes, that is true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may select the smallest of things and forgive us. But how can we be so in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love that we abandon to do the abandon the things he tells us to do? This is we are too good for this kind of mindset, this sort of secular mindset. It doesn't even make sense. Your belief should lead to action. If it is in the inside, it will grow into action. If you have the seed, if you genuinely think you have the seed, then it should grow into action. And every single part of our identity, we wear it on our sleeves, metaphorically and literally. Everything that is part of who we are, we always display. But then when it comes to Islam, for some reason, that is the thing that has to be in our chest. That is the thing that's inside of me. I have Islam inside of me. I have modesty inside of you, inside of me. Islam will affect you your family, your community, the society, the world, because that is the nur that we are talking about, sisters. That is the guidance, that is the light, that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will affect everything. So stop trying to cage your Islam between your ribs and keep it in your chest. Allow your Islam to change you and to change your life. If you would have noticed, sisters, today in this whole session, we haven't really spoken about men, because even though we're talking about hijab, first and foremost, this is a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the idea that is for men is slightly misplaced. It benefits the whole society, yes, and there's wisdom in it that benefits men and women, but fundamentally, it is a commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, inshallah. I think we've mostly spoken about the benefits. I think one of the things I just want to touch upon very quickly is that in terms of modesty, sisters, sisters who have children, I just want everyone to be very, very mindful of the example that we are setting because sometimes we are the ones taking our children to immodest gatherings. We are the ones telling them that their cousins are like their brothers. We are the ones telling, you know, our daughters that it's fine to let, you know, an uncle that isn't actually their uncle pat them on the head because it's polite. We are the ones saying all of these things. And then tomorrow, when they then take it to the next level, then we are unhappy. You know, we say it's fine for such and such to pat you on the head. But then when we see that they're letting men shake their hands at work, we're not happy. Set the example from the get go. 
don't let it be that the things you are unhappy with are the things that you actually taught your children yourself. So inshallah, if anyone has any other ideas or some of the benefits of modesty, you can pop it in the chat for everyone, inshallah. Um, and so, you know, the most supportive thing we can do and the most beneficial thing we can do to bring about change is not have discussions about hijab and how you should give advice about hijab with like wisdom and all of this is true. But the most powerful thing you can do to support your Muslim sister is to wear hijab as well and to wear it the way it should be worn. So inshallah, we'll just circle back to one last thing and then we'll round everything up. I think this is very important because we spoke about it at the beginning as well about spiritual modesty. The Prophet وسلم, said, be modest before Allah as is his right. And the Sahaba at this time said, we have modesty, all praises due to Allah. And the Prophet وسلم, said, no, rather modesty before Allah as is his right is to guard the mind and what runs through it and guard the stomach and what fills it and to reflect upon death and trials whoever desires the hereafter let him abandon the embellishments of worldly life whoever has done so has been modest before Allah as is his right why have I put this hadith up I put it up because again at the beginning we spoke about internal modesty spiritual modesty which is something we can all agree on but it's then the next step of covering ourselves that people struggle with so I will, I'm just going to put this simple question out there, that if we have true internal modesty, the way the Prophet wasallam described, that we are too shy to think of something that displeases Allah, to eat something that displeases Allah, that we are so modest that we reflect upon death and we want only the hereafter and we have left behind the glamour of the dunya, if we are so internally modest in that way, then is there any room to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command? Is there any room? There's no room. Okay, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, everyone. And I think one of the things that we spoke about in terms of wearing the scarf it is difficult. In terms of covering yourself, it is difficult. But one of the things is when you have support around you, it becomes the easiest thing you will ever do. It becomes so easy when you surround yourself with good company. And subhanAllah, everyone here today, you could have been listening to any of the hundreds and thousands of talks out there about modesty, but you were listening to one that was delivered essentially by UK Islamic Mission. And the way UK Islamic Mission works is that it's a volunteer-based organization. We all support each other to do good work and to mentor each other and help each other to do what is good and give back to our society. And we are actually fundraising for all the work that we are doing. So we do classes like this and we have classes live in mosques and in centers up and down the UK. I think we have over 50 branches. We do work in Dawa. We do work for youth, we do work for kids, we do work for eye care, relief. Um, we do work for other things as well. I apologize to any of the departments if I've forgotten the department. SubhanAllah, we do so much and we are fundraising so that we can continue doing the work that we are doing. And I would also like to request sisters, if you have any money that you would like to donate, we are raising money for Turkey and Syria. It's an earthquake appeal. There's been a lot of destruction, a lot of difficulty that people have been put through. And like we said at the beginning, the ummah is one body. And so we should feel for our brothers and sisters. So if you have any money to spare, please do donate. Follow us on social media, inshallah. Um, and that will help you keep up to date with everything that's happening. And we will make dua and conclude the session. Yeah. Oh Allah, give us strength of character to be Muslims in what is a difficult age, to be Muslims and make it easy for us. Ya Allah, give us the strength of character and the strength of Iman, as was of the women of Ansar who tore their waistcloths and covered themselves when they heard these verses. O oh Allah, make us of those who are modest before you, as is your right. O oh Allah, give us good morals. Oh Allah, do not let us fall into the whispers of shaitan. Ya Allah, beautify us from the inside out. Ya Allah, grant us good companionship. Oh Allah, give us the strength of character 
to change ourselves, to change our families, to change our communities and to change the world. Amin. Ya Allah, enter us all into Jannah al Firdaus. Amin. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Awadu billahi wa rajim subhanu rahim. Wala asr inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.